As long as it, um, I can do the pointer, and as long as if I push the space bar, yeah, space bar or forward and back or up and down. Okay. Any of those will. And and so this, the live stream is being. They can see your slides. Excellent. If I'll check it once we've started, so I'll, but. Okay. I'm disappointed because that didn't show that you did recognize it momentarily. Ooh. It's okay. It's fine. It's no Ooh. worry. It's fine. I can manage. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think we'll uh, get uh, crafting with the second and um, yours of uh, the autumn term. My name is Sarah Perry, and alongside uh, Jill, Judy, and John. Schofield, I help to coordinate the Lord's um, seminars, and I'm just here briefly to let you know that the seminar is being uh, live streamed through YouTube on the department's um, UY Archaeology uh, YouTube account. And I mention that in part because you might want to go back and revisit uh, Alex's uh, ideas <laughs> and words, uh, and I mention it in case you want to share it with uh, others. We also I tweet um, the seminars, if you use um, Twitter, we use the hashtag yours, Y-O-H-R-S, so if you have questions from the audience that you uh, would prefer to ask via digital media, you can do so, and those uh, that are watching on the live stream can uh, tweet in questions too. And with that said, I'll pass it over to Thanks very much, Sarah. Hi, I'm Jill Chitty, I'm Director of Studies for Conservation. Um, great pleasure for me tonight to welcome Alex Holton to talk to us. Any of you will know Alex already. He was a um, PhD student in this department. He teaches on conservation studies program. Some of you have just joined us. Uh, we'll have the pleasure of hearing Alex talk about Durham and indeed going to Durham with Alex um, in the spring term as part of the conservation solutions module. Uh, but tonight, um, Alex is going to talk about some of the difficult, challenging conservation choices that Durham uh, Cathedral in North Porch is presenting to uh, the um, Cathedral architect with whom he works at Purcell. Um, Alex's PhD research was on the archaeology and conservation at the East Front of York Minster, I believe, uh, when he looked at the history of and challenges 
or conserving that particular masonry. Durham presents a very different range of problems, some of the same philosophical debates possibly, Alex, but we're going to hear more about that now. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back in King's Manor, and um, I, I know that the usual form of these lectures tends to be someone well on with their um, research or understanding, or they've even completed a project and they're sharing the outcomes with the audience and reflecting on those outcomes. But um, I thought I would shamelessly use this opportunity to um, do, do a lecture where we're at the very, very beginning of the project. And there are a lot of questions um, and we're not quite sure where it's all heading at the moment and we've, we've got to a certain point. And I thought it would be great to actually share where we are and, and what the situation is with the Porch of Durham Cathedral. And then to, for us to actually have a discussion at the end of this and think about the options and think about the next steps and the various opinions that I'm sure will emerge as a result of this talk. And, and the Porch of Durham, um, although it deals with the, the sort of particular material problems and the contextual problems of Durham and Durham Cathedral and its stone and its position on the Durham Peninsula, there are also many common denominators with stonework conservation and repair generally and how cathedrals see themselves and how cathedrals present themselves so hopefully this will will stimulate a good discussion towards the um, towards the end yes it works okay so this is um Durham cathedral which i hope all of you are familiar with either having gone there or from the textbooks um, absolutely stunning site, a World Heritage Site that was inscribed by UNESCO in 1986. Um, and I show you it in, in this way so that you understand um, not only the, the, the architectural composition, but also its placement high up on a cliff, essentially, within Durham. And so we've got the River Weir in the valley below here and the cathedral sat on the peninsula above alongside Durham Castle, which was the medieval palatial home of the Prince Bishops of Durham. Um, the, uh, the peninsula um, became uh, established as a religious foundation um, in, in about 995 when the monks from Lindisfarne um, bought um, Cuthbert, St. Cuthbert's uh, relics, his body, um, into Durham for safety um, and up onto the peninsula. And here they established, we think, the Timber Church um, somewhere on the site that was then transformed into a stone church known as the White Church and, and that became the, uh, the, the foundation of the cathedral as we see it today. The whole Saxon uh, tra uh, cathedral was transformed from 1093 onwards with the great Romanesque building campaign. This began at the east end of the cathedral to, to act as a very formal and grand house for the, the shrine of St Cuthbert. So from the central tower and back to the eastern end here. And that campaign was completed pretty quickly between 1093 and 1104. And that involved the use of pointed vaults for the first time, which was obviously a key moment and stepping stone in the development of Gothic architecture, which is partly um, Durham's uh, world heritage significance. It's placed within the development of Gothic. So this is between 1093 and 1104. They then proceeded quite quickly with the nave from 1104 back to the west front um, up until about 1133 when the vaults were in place over the nave. So this section up to 1133. And then in 1189, they added the gallery, which actually blocked off the main grand western entrance to the cathedral. So the north porch, which is the, the focus of this talk, just located here went from being the general sort of everyday entrance into the cathedral to the main processional entrance quite early in the, the Romanesque cathedral's life. So the Galilee Chapel changed the way that people accessed and used the cathedral. This was about 1189. The, uh, the, um, the upward extension of the Western Towers occurred in the early 13th century, and this was soon followed by the opening out of the Eastern End to contain more altars, and this was the Chapel of Nine Altars which uh, parallels closely with the nine altars at Fountain's Abbey. And then really things remained pretty much as they were. And so very coherent Norman cathedral, Romanesque cathedral, up to the late 15th century, when a lightning strike caused the upper section of the tower to be rebuilt by about 1488. 
So what we've been left with is an extremely <coughs> coherent um, Romanesque cathedral overall, and, and certainly that's experienced within the interior um, with some later medieval alterations. And the north porch sits quite happily within that, that great Romanesque building campaign. So this is the porch um, getting close up and, and personal with it. Um, I'll come on to the condition later on in the talk, but for the moment this is just to set out the, the key elements and then the, the history and understanding of it as, as we understand it right now. So what we've got here is um, the, the, the main Romanesque pork larch into the nave of the cathedral. So now the principal entrance into the cathedral composed of these several carved orders and then the capitals along here and the columns. And then this outer shell of masonry wrapping round the, the entrance um, based on this sort of stocky buttress design with the crenellations at the top. And then this fairly plain gable here, which it, it's hard to discern now, but in fact carries um, some, some relief panelling going up towards the apex of the arch. And then we've got a rather weathered looking finial at the top there. Um, so this is the, the porch as it is at present. And then um, coming up in detail, you can see the varying quality of the carving within the arch going to something very strong and clear and discernible um, uh, within the, the entrance here out to the more weathered form on the outside and then the gable above and then these interesting um, capitals running around the, the outside which are believed not to have any parallel um, certainly in, in Durham um, and you can see their, their varying condition there that we've we've got a, some some detail as we get into the, the inner orders of the arch staying quite crisp and discernible but then the upper elements varying condition there and then this sanding back and softening of the detail and and, and then some loss to the column here and then here we can quite clearly see um, a repair that happened in the mid 20th century which chose not to and emulate or repeat any of the detail of the capital that had come before. So thinking about the history of this porch and understanding its development, um, not only stylistically um, and design terms, but also into repair. So this is the earliest drawing that we have that includes the porch um, in this rather sketchy form um, by Daniel King, 1655 when at that point the cathedral institution was actually in turmoil um, in the wake of the, the civil war, the see of Durham was disbanded and there was no bishop in place. And for a time the, the cathedral um, was even used as a, a prison uh, house for, for Scottish prisoners. So this is the, um, the, the impression of the doorway at that time and uh, gradually this impression evolves as we go through the drawings, but it gives us a sense of its its previous form and the, the there's the law um, L-O-R-E that is associated with the, um, the the north porch and it's the law of sanctuary that um, anyone could um, uh, uh, that had been involved in any sort of crime or wrongdoing could claim sanctuary at the north door of the cathedral by running up to it before um, any sort of justice of the peace or judge or police had grabbed them to claim sanctuary and they would be admitted inside and would be protected all the time they were in the cathedral. And uh, that was actually set out in a very valuable document of 1593 known as the Rites of Durham, which was an accumulated narrative of the, uh, the condition of the cathedral and how it was used um, at the time of the Reformation and just after. So this whole idea of sanctuary and claiming sanctuary of the porch um, is kind of stuck with, um, with the rites of Durham and was handed down. And it was believed that there was an upper chamber in this top section of the porch. You can just see these little windows here that were used by watchmen to look out for people claiming sanctuary. And gradually, um, as more research has, has, has occurred, um, it's felt that that, that that whole sanctuary idea was something that came about quite late in the cathedral's life. And actually this upper room was, was probably used for actually coordinating major processions and liturgical processions through the north door and this being the main entrance from the bishop from his palace on the other side of the green. And there are some really interesting stories and, and, and historic uses associated with the porch. So this is the earliest drawing and then we come to this depiction by 
John Bailey in 1780, um, which, which shows the porch very different um, as it stands today, with a substantial block above the entrance, which apparently had these two rooms um, within it. And we can see in here some, some uh, evidence of probably Romanesque configuration. So the round arch is in here and the string course above. So perhaps the, the first formation in the Romanesque phase, the 11th or early, uh, 12, early 12th century phase contained in here. And then some 13th century addition and embellishment going up and around the porch to, to give us this form, but obviously quite different from what we've got. And this was recorded again um, posthumously, as we'll see, by John Carter in the late 18th century, who gave us a bit more um, detail um, uh, in, in how the, the porch was looking in the late 18th century. Um, you can see here this Romanesque arch sat within this sort of grand gabled structure. And here what we have for the first time is a nice clear representation of the arms of Elizabeth I that were placed on the porch sometime around uh, 1569. And that is still within the cathedral collections. So we're able to compare that with the engraving. Um, and at the moment we've no evidence for this, but we do wonder whether or not, although we've got this plaque as the main piece of evidence, whether or not at that point um, uh, a grand overhaul of the porch generally had taken place at that point, which might explain the quality of the arch carving um, and the, the nature of the, and form of the capitals going around the doorway. So we'll come on to that. But, it, but, but this was obviously a major event which may have had an impact on this arch. And then in 1787, um, or just before that actually, there was a report um, by the consultant um, engineer and architect, John Wooler, um, who reported on the state of the, the cathedral, um, which was in a pretty poor condition into the 18th century. And all sorts of things were recommended, um, which included the paring back of the stonework of the outside of the cathedral by up to two to three inches, so chiselling back to remove all of the decayed material from the outside of the building. So at that moment, all of the mouldings that had been on, that, on the outside of the building that, that decayed were reduced sort of ghost-like uh, evidence of, of mouldings. And at the same time, he reported on the structural issues related to the porch and that the scale and size of the porch and the amount of masonry there had caused the porch to separate away from the building. And so um, as an engineer, he basically prescribed reducing that weight and mass and, and, and bringing the scale of the porch down. And the, the new porch um, was created by 1787, as it's documented by the resident architect, George Nicholson, um, who was likely responsible for this design. So a rather sort of meek and, and uh, tentative effort at, at Gothic to surround um, the arch and opinions vary as to how much this inner arch was altered at that point, but we, we feel pretty sure that the, that, the, um, that the whole surround was completely reconstructed at that point. So it gives us um, um, the porch that we, we see today, more or less. So we're, we're fortunate enough to have a reasonable photographic record of the porch once we get into the late 19th century. Um, which shows the two pinnacles here still actually present. Um, and then the, the gable there with its panelling going up, the door minus its iron gates, which are there now. And this one usefully shows this, um, this lady up against the, the door here. Um, and, and that helps show the scowl. And um, in, in the early 20th century, um, the Dean and Chapter got very scared of the suffragette movement and decided that a big set of iron gates would be, would be uh, worth putting on the front of the cathedral. So these were put in by 1914. So we've got some benchmarks as to the condition of the, um, of the, the doorway at that point. And you can see um, that, that it was in a pretty eroded state within the arch at that point. So evidence of a sort of long and gradual erosion, but incredibly crisp detail here. And given the exposure of the site and the manner in which it decays, it does raise questions about the, the date of this carving and, and the, the likelihood that it is not Romanesque. Um, but, but more work needs to be done there, I'm sure. 
So um, we then move into the early 20th century when there are frequent reports on the poor condition of the porch and that bits of stone are falling off and that there are problems with the condition of the stonework. Um, and uh, Caro, W.D. Caro, the architect of the cathedral, pushed for something quite radical to um, reconstruct the upper gable partly on, dis on, on the grounds of being dissatisfied with the design, um, but then also um, be because so much of the stonework was in that poor condition. But because of lack of funds, a lot of the repair work was deferred and deferred and deferred. And the most that it got round to was taking these down because of their condition. Um, it's likely that he under, uh, undertook stone preservation experiments on the porch. Um, we don't know what was used yet. We may never know. Um, more work to be done there again. But there, was, there were efforts at stone preservation at the cathedral which uh, come in at the same time as stone preservation efforts on the, um, on the castle, just, um, just opposite the cathedral. So uh, a growing momentum of the need for repair. Um, but much of it's still localised at the time of Caro. And this brings together the sort of the, uh, the main phases of, of change and repair that we understand have taken place. I'm um, just sketched out at the moment because, as I, as I say, we're in the, in the sort of early stages of this project. Um, but but by, uh, by nature of the design, the pictorial evidence and the difference in geology, which is very helpful to have, um, we feel that this is representative of the Wooler and Nicholson intervention. So the outer um, Gothic revival um, casing. Um, we then, we're not exactly sure when this dates to, um, but, but clearly quite a, of a different period to what was done in the late 18th century, and different geology entirely. Um, similarly, we think these are of an uncertain date. Um, Behind, we think we've got the Norman work, this grey area here, we've, we've got that in the masonry and probably down here as well. And then these two outer um, uh, columns with their capitals, we know were, were renewed in 1955. So what we're dealing with, um, rather than just a single phase of, um, of, of building and, um, and, and understanding, is something that's an aggregate of periods and efforts to change and alter and present the, the porch of the cathedral. And we tried to distill this understanding um, into some headline um, heritage values that, 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 that are helping us get our head around the significance of the porch and how we might use that as a tool in decision making and looking at relative values as well as the sort of absolute values that we think we might be able to apply to the porch. So. Um, I'll just run through these and I've, I've set them out in text um, just so that I can remember them mainly. Um, so the communal values and, and we, we tend to use English heritage as conservation principles to set out our understanding. Um, so the communal value, it's that principal point of entry into the cathedral church for every worshipper, pilgrim and tourist and that's something that, that's held very dear by the, um, the dean and chapter of the cathedral. This is the point at which you, you, you first engage and witness and enjoy Durham Cathedral, um, either as a worshipper, either as a pilgrim to the Shrine of St Cuthbert, or as just the, the lay visitor and tourist there to experience the place. And it's that threshold from the outside world into this sacred interior and shrine of St Cuthbert. It is the starting point of major processions and service liturgy each year there's a festival for the Durham Miners Association um, which goes back many, many years and they begin with their banners at the North Porch and process into the cathedral. Um, there's a, it's a symbol of welcome and open hospitality um, to all who seek entry in the Dean and Chapter again. They like to be able to link this sense of welcome and hospitality back to the Benedictine origins of the cathedral when it was a, a monastic house that, um, that welcomed people through hospitality and learning and welcome. Um, we then have the historical values that we, we um, attempt to connect with the place. So we've got the associative values, the associations. Well, the porch is connected with that great celebrated Romanesque building campaign of 1104 and 1128, which is captured within the statement of um, outstanding universal value of the World Heritage Site. 
So that, that, that association with that great campaign is deemed to be very important by architectural historians. Um, it's associative with the rights of Durham. So there is mention of this porch um, through time and history and that law of sanctuary. It's also associated with named architects and engineers who were the inglorious restorers of Durham Cathedral in the late 18th century. Um, I tend to place their association less in rank to the Romanesque building campaign, but we'll come on to that. Um, and we've got further historic value um, in terms of the, the illustrative historic value, so what the actual the place actually um, illustrates and tells us about the past through its fabric. So the Romanesque portal is emblematic of Darn Cathedral, despite the potential for later interventions. It's that prelude to the experience within. And to the lay person, they're probably not that bothered whether or not it's 12th century or 16th century or 18th century. Um, it, it's that, that presentation of, of the Romanesque and the Romanesque style, which is that first taster of what Durham is all about, architecture. Um, it also could potentially have that connection with the period through its fabric of Elizabeth I, or maybe Bishop John Cousin, who restored the building um, following the restoration of the monarchy in the 1660s, and certainly the capitals have that sort of classical feel within them that, that was part of the, um, the sort of language of John Cousin's work as well, where he was blending Gothic and classical. So potentially that connection there, which would be particularly important in the history of Durham and, and the architecture of Durham. And then it's also illustrative as an example of Gothic restoration, not perhaps the best or grandest example, certainly when we look at the contributions of James Wyatt at the castle and Anthony Salve as well. Um, this perhaps doesn't rank as, as the best example, but it is an example. We must bear that in mind. Um, and then the evidential value, well, in, in our view, um, we've got to be mindful of that potential for um, the 18th century and later fabric to actually conceal something of that 12th century building or 13th century building, the medieval core, which would of course be of great interest if any repairs were undertaken and stones and removed. We need to anticipate the, 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 the sort of likelihood of finding um, further fabric of value, which would add to our interpretation and understanding. Um, and then the aesthetic values, where there's the design value again, and the Romanesque style, and, which is the system that lies at the heart of Durham's international architectural value. The context and the setting on Palace Green in the peninsula, the first architectural showcase <laughs> of the cathedral that the visitor can experience at close range. And then that use of traditional materials and the rich variation and texture in those materials, which obviously lends itself very nicely to the cathedral and, and to the porch. So then thinking about condition and the actual issues that we're facing with the, the significance of the building <coughs> as a backdrop. Um, so you can see, um, as we, we alluded to at the beginning, that we've got this, this porch with, with a softening of detail overall. That's, that's fairly harmonious when we stand back from it. But you can see through the shadows here that there is pocketing of the stonework um, and loss of detail to, the, uh, to the, the Gothic with the K elements at the top. So the Wooler and Nicholson work and, and losses here and also in here. And then this softening and loss of the um, of details of the archway, principally on this outer order. And usefully with the um, with the benefit of the, the photographic record that we have, we can actually track the loss of, um, of, these, of these details over time and the pace at which loss is happening. Um, and then when we come up, up close and personal, um, we've got some fairly um, serious issues with the stonework. Now that we've got the benefit of the scaffold, we're actually losing mouldings, peeling away from the outer order of the arch around the Romanesque arch, so the hood mould. Um, here, what we've got is a, a pocketing of the stonework, which is now revealing the rubble work within the building. So a stone has eroded back to the inner lime mortar core of the structure. Um, we've also got, um, quite unfortunately, some, some quite problematic inherent design defects. From the, uh, from the restoration in the late 18th century, where we've got this poor 
detail in arrangement here with vertical joints. That's one thing which allows water to penetrate into the top of top of the structure, and then a water run here with no proper apex stone, no no solid stone here running through, which allows water to track its way into the stonework below, which is probably causing and contributing to the deterioration below. Um, and this here are some, some shreds of the moulding profile, still with tooling on, that have, that have survived, which are useful references for the, 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 the amount of loss over time, but also to inform us as and when we come to approach the repair of this structure. Um, but, but as we've got up close to it, we realise that there, there are a number of stones that really are beyond the sort of in situ repair approach and that there is going to be a need for action here. And we've had the, the sort of necessary falls of stone that you need to really get a conservation project up and running. Um, normally a project doesn't happen so it's, until bits start falling off. So we've got that now. And, um, and so there, there is an active sort of safety issue here and, and deterioration is active. And you can see here that what we've got is dust um, as, that, that's occurring and um, accumulating along the arch, along the top of the, um, the hood moulding, and um, that's accumulating within pockets here. So we've got decay debris, and this is fresh decay debris here. So we've got an active decay scenario. And if you take this dental tool and push it into it, you can see that, that we've got a reasonable depth of, of crud building up on, on the top of the arch there. Um, and then this is the arch below itself. So we're, we're of the mind that this is a 18th century restoration here, but that we've got an earlier arch of some form tracking back behind. But you can see that this is a design detail as well as actually failing through, through sort of weathering over time is incredibly poor. It, it's, it's conceived as a sort of a plique hood molding for design value rather than something that ever had a reasonable function to shed water off and away from the arch below. And here, this is a perforation. So you can see right through the, um, the hood mold stones here. Um, and water is tracking down this, running over the weathered surfaces into the arch. And you can see the patterns of weathering here, and then through the holes within the arch and affecting the, the masonry of the arch below. And we've also got the accumulation of um, pollution crusts here, which are encapsulated in detail to a certain extent, that are gradually blistering and peeling away to, to reveal some quite soft and vulnerable substrates below. So we've got a structure that's, that is actively deteriorating, gradually um, deteriorating, granted, but it is deteriorating. So there's a, a sense of responsibility to, to intervene in some form. At the top here, where the pinnacles were taken away, um, in, the, in the late 1920s, um, a concrete lid was put on top of the buttresses, which is then um, is trapping moisture in and around this, this corona structure here. And we've got the bedding planes of the stone, so the natural layers of, of formation within the stone, the geological formation layers of the stone, opening up and separating. And these, you can actually lift off and leave the back <coughs> where the stones are opening up. And saturation here, where we, we haven't got anywhere for the, the water that concentrates here. And you can see that from all this bio growth on the top is then affecting the stonework below. Also on the buttresses, we've got a similar scenario to the hood moulds over the arch, that the, the uh, weathering courses here are deteriorating and retreating back. So water is not being thrown away from the face of the stones, but it's tracking through and causing deterioration to the, the stonework below. Um, of, of equal concern um, is what this scenario outside is doing to the building inside and the fabric inside. The inside of the porch, as you come into the, the nave of the cathedral, um, you can see that there's this wonderful um, order of carved work or orders of carved work on the inside, and there's a, an iconographical cycle just above the doorway here and above where water has been gradually permeating through the fabric. Um, you can see the salt hazes here as moisture is coming through and evaporating and open joints. And so again, quite a serious issue that, that needs to be dealt with. And we've done salt tests here 
And we know that magnesium sulfate is involved, and that's because the mortars used to build the cathedral derive from magnesium limestone, which has the potential to develop quite an aggressive um, salt and decay mechanism that, that parallels the, the decay mechanism that we've experienced with, with York Minster, which is built magnesium limestone full. Um, and also nitrates, which normally come from the ground, but also from biological um, growth. So we know that with all of the moss and plants that are going on up here, that the nitrates that we're picking up here are a result of water coming down from the very top of the porch into the building and we're, we're tracking the nitrates. So the salts are telling us where water's coming from and that there's a, a route from outside to in that we, we, we feel strongly we need to address. So in summary, and bringing this together, so the, 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 the issues of significance as well as the, the conservation and condition <coughs> issues, the North Porch is the primary portal into Darwin Cathedral. The fabric of the North Porch is an aggregate of ages from the 12th century to the 20th century. The North Porch has a range of heritage values and is significant. The North Porch is deteriorating. Deterioration has been gradual overall, but it's now an advanced stage in certain areas. Decay is being exacerbated by inherent design defects and poor material selection. And action is required to mitigate deterioration and protect and enhance the significance of the porch. But the, the point where we're at now, which is um, hopefully something we can begin to discuss as a group, is, is what level of action is appropriate here um, and, and how do we go about it. And there are all sorts of factors that we need to balance. Clearly, we want to protect the heritage value and significance of the porch. We have to think about the sustainability of our chosen course of action and, and that what we do now, how much is that going to improve the, uh, the position of future repairers or detract from that. Um, we have to think about safety if this is the main route into a cathedral with so many hundreds of visitors, if not more, um, into the cathedral um, every day. Um, we need we have an obligation, we have a legal obligation to make sure that that entrance is safe for the people coming and going into the cathedral. We have to think about the cost and, and budget and, and timing of, and cost of works and how often the cathedral can revisit um, a certain part of the building, given that it needs to be within a constant cycle of, of repairs around the whole cathedral and its precinct. And then we also have to manage as the consultants to the cathedral client expectation and vision and um, there's one thing thinking about what we all think about the porch and then we also have to um, acknowledge and absorb and think about what what the dean and chapter feel about the porch and what the congregation feel about the porch and so on and how they feel it's representative of them and there's a general clamor amongst um, cathedrals and churches that the condition of the fabric is an expression of the condition of the church as an institution um, and the, a withering doorway is a, a, a reflection of a withering um, religion. So they feel very strongly about these things <laughs> and, and we have to take that seriously. So it's weighing all of these things and, and getting the, the solution that's right for the building and, and, and so on. So what we, we, we've been toying with are the, just in sketch form are the various things that we might do from sort of minimum works to perhaps more extensive works, depending on, on the, the sort of direction of travel as we develop our understanding and engage more with, with um, stakeholders and advisors and so on. Um, so this, we, we've sort of begun to set out the, the option one scenario where we feel this is the, the sort of minimum level of repair that's needed to stop the water entering the building and the core of the building um, and to get elements and performing as they should be to um, throw water away at the right point and away from the building and just to manage water running down the face of the uh, of the porch because water of course is the chief agent of, of stonework decay. So, so in this situation we're, we're suggesting we could renew that hood mould which we know has got the perforations in it and is no longer throwing water away um, from what we believe to be the relatively more significant portal and, and the, the Romanesque arch within that there's a, 
a relative value to the various elements and that this could be held to be more important than this. That's just where we are at the moment. Um, and then these stones as well. And the, the red uh, sort of borderline where we're, we're in a situation where they could be retained, but, but the fact that they engage with this hood mold, you could then end up with all sorts of difficult stepping in and out, which creates water shelves and so on. And we don't want water sat on the, on the porch. So, so they are possible, but that, that is the sort of minimum scenario in terms of stonework renewals to just safeguard the fabric as we see it at the moment. And then within the arch to just undertake surface mortar repairs to protect, protect the carved work, to protect the decaying surfaces on the columns and the, the chevron order here, but to otherwise just undertake a, a very light touch repointing um, campaign at the moment there's a lot of cement all over the arch which i should have mentioned which is helping to sort of trap moisture and salts and the usual issues there so um to undertake you know the, the minimum works within the arch and to treat that as the sort of sacred element of the building um but just to sort of flag up again the, the, the technical issues that we need to be mindful of and it would be good to share ideas and thoughts on this further when I'm, when I'm done rabbiting on. Um, but, but to think about the impact of localised repairs when you're dealing with something that is very weathered and, and where you can have, um, this is Linda's farm, um, where you can have absolutely technical, cor technically correct repairs where they've replaced stones that, are, that were, I assume, um, those that were deemed structurally unsound and to reinstate to the to the former building line so that we haven't got renewals retreating back um, into this weathered surface but of course they do affect the the sort of uh, the, the harmony and readability of the, the fabric from an archaeological perspective that might be quite correct but there are questions about the lay perspective on on this approach and, and when you get this lego effect up the building of stepping in and out so it's something that needs to be considered carefully that in, in, in treating these things unit by unit, are you actually harming the overall aesthetic values of the building? So something to discuss and probably no right or wrong, but, but it's something that needs to be thought about and tackled. Um, and then op options two and three, um, I've just shown this combined here, um, but op options two and three take um, a rather more thorough or extensive approach where we would consider um, renewing um, everything in blue either to the design that was established there by Willer and Nicholson and we have the documentary evidence we have the photographic evidence and across this we are able to record and reclaim the moldings we have that evidence there so this would be achievable um, and would obviously maintain the sort of de clear design integrity between the buttresses which are in, still in, in good condition overall um, and the gable and then also do the same with the 18th century section of the arch because we know this order was replaced um, as part of this campaign um, but um, matching the chevron orders in here which are in good enough condition to keep and then again going for that um, much and more restrained and careful approach within the arch. Or option three is to say, well, we're dissatisfied with this as a design system and also in the way that the, the weathering system was handled, we've got um, hood moulds that don't work here. Is, is this a point where we dispense with this design because it doesn't work and that we feel irresponsible replacing something with something else that doesn't work and that we go for a completely new um, gable within here that is very carefully thought out, that it is very carefully considered within its context and how it works, so that it, that it is a structure that performs correctly and it is in a way um, an, uh, an honest approach saying we're not copying something from the 18th century. We believe this to have gone to a point where we're now saying let's have a clear demonstration of how we thought now and how we approached it now uh, just as they did in the late 18th century um, and 
yeah, that that's probably where where I will um, leave it. Um, so that's where we are in sort of thinking, um, and there are obviously the more detailed next steps that we're going to the detailed stone by stone condition appraisal um, and documentation, so that we've got a very sound record of, of the picture right now. Um, to undertake further research into the Romanesque arch because there are uncertainties about its date and importance um, off the basis of that date. Um, contextual research on Nicholson and Wooler and how they fit into the picture of Gothic revival and, and restoration. So far, their contributions seem to have been fairly local, um, but that needs to be pushed further. We need to understand the materials so that when we do do repairs, we are introducing material that we know is compatible. And then also what we're doing, uh, re recording and reconstruction drawings as a basin for discussing the merits or other ones of reinstating the 18th century design so that we actually have a, a clearer picture of, of, of what we might gain if we, we go to those lengths. So lots to think about and um, thank you um, for your time. And uh, your opinions are welcome. Well, we're going to switch on to the camera now because um, there were some technical difficulties advancing your slides on the screen. They could hear everything you said, oh, right. but we only saw your first slide for the entire presentation. Oh, it's a nice slide, though. So. <laughs> 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 Just say who you are a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start off with my mind I, I was quite interested. You, you had these sort of five kind of, um, sort of key um, issues that you have to think about in, in, in formulating your strategy for repair, which were things like protection, sustainability, and client mm -hmm. expectations. And I just thought, that, is there another one which might be public expectation? Because that is, from what you said, that is a big part of its significance, that it announces the entrance and welcome to you know, this building, which is the kind of pinnacle of the World Heritage Site. And, and is there a kind of public expectation that you have to satisfy? And have you done any work to think, to find out what that public expectation might be about what the entrance to a mm. building like that should, should look like? That's a very good question, and we, we've made that recommendation to the chapter that we do seek opinion from the, the wider community. Um, because often we get so embroiled in our own very scholarly debates with all these things, which are obviously important and steer to a conclusion that we think, well, what does the lay person think? And are they really that bothered with it? It's a bit moldy. Yeah. Can we just do the minimum to them? You know, I, mean, I, I alluded to it with the, the, the whole thing of Roman Scarch that we could get very sort of deep into the um, historical narrative mm -hmm. on that and exactly when those capitals were done and who and when they relate to. But to the everyday, you just see it and you think, wow, it's this great part of Roman Scarch. And you probably didn't appreciate the scale of it from the photographs, but it's certainly something to be seen when you stand up there. Things just shot above you, this, this arch, and that, that's probably enough for most people. So, I think it's important. Um, and I don't know if, if people know if, if, if York Minster have ever done anything like that, and how do they handle the, the, the Vesica approach to the South Transept? Do, do, do we know how, how far and wide that was spread? And I know that's the way to how that would be looked I think there is a 
possibility that when you talk about protecting heritage values, it automatically puts you into a conservative mindset. Whereas I think if you talk about enhancing and sustaining the heritage values and talking about public benefit, I think you get a more kind of positive perspective. That's what we can do with that. I think it's I think it's really important it, since the HLF project, which is about um, enhancing this experience around the culture, that very much set itself up to enhance access and therefore perception and therefore significance and reveal things. So I think the cathedral now conversing with setting the setting approach in that way. So um, I mean, our, our brief to begin with was just let's get a scaffold up and can you take all the bits down that are likely to fall on people? <laughs> so, we're, you know, we're, we're treading, treading carefully into it. But I, I, you're absolutely right, Keith. I think we need to understand public, public perception of this more. In fact, it often it brings it into other people. You know what? I was It is, yeah, and it's to be honest, we've had the benefit of Matthias working mm -hmm. with this event, but but the, the yeah, the works team needs investment and growth, and um, projects like this are you know, necessary. You know, to, we want these skills to remain at the cathedral um, because they are as much a heritage asset you know, that institution that those things and their connection and crafts. They're part of the personality, and um, so opportunities for them you know, are really important in celebrating craftsmanship and using the yeah. celebrating craftsmanship. So I think um, at the moment we've been we've been sort of kicking our feet on the ground and just making sure we we understand that there's an initial cause for intervention because. Often, in many ways, what we'd rather do is nothing. Um, but once we're into that ground, which we're entering now, we realise things aren't actively occurring and that there are all sorts of combined defects, both inherent in design and material, but also then the condition things. Then I think, well, is this the moment to actually push things? And I don't, I don't know what other people think who, who are working in heritage at the moment. But there seems to be quite a creative sort of uh, buzz going on in heritage generally where we're, maybe we're in a sort of major shift now where we're, we're starting to, to step beyond the sort of traditional red line and push things further. So it might be something that helps do that a bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, it was kind of popular. I can say something that was sort of along those lines. And it's, uh, Perhaps actually public expectation really is that you would actually be going further than um, um, sort of the general sort of conservative approach due to conservation and security, and that public actually don't really understand why we are so uh, conservative. I mean, I'm, I'm struck that people. With very positive comments about the very controversial replacement of the um, West Wing with Minsko. But um, the general public seems to think that's absolutely fantastic. <coughs> you know, with it, with the craftsmanship and things like that. I mean, we might see real issues with doing that. 
sons. But, um, that's particularly with the eighteenth century world. Um, we could at least um, be a little more straightforward in our approach. We have to be able to do minimal conservation of something which isn't perfect. And um, where we actually can recover the design if we want it to be um, which seems quite interesting to me. It, it seems quite a, a sort of, for its date, quite a it's a, it's a combination between sort of archaeology, I think, but not in the very valid scholarly sense no, when you no, compare no, it to no, 19th I mean, it's, century. But it's it, valid it's quite Yes, yeah, it does, it does. And, and also with the scale of it now, that, that squashed gable, clearly a sort of engineer's choice rather than architects. It just has to get away from this thing. It's rather squat, then. Yes. I'm probably revealing what I think of it. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John Davies, I would like to ask you about the Open that back up because I haven't got a clue to be honest. What I what I'd actually ask the public. How would you how would you approach the public on something like this? I've just been recently up and down, and, and I was sorry, it's been so nice. And um, do you have like insight? You talked about for the Lego attack how it looks the new bits, and you have the Lego people inside. And then most of you probably don't know, or you can buy like a brick or a pan. And I think you know nearly 100,000 pounds. So 100,000 people given a pan, being there, being aware of it, why not putting a questionnaire at back and forth there? And just the same yeah. time that you pay that pan, maybe you fill a little form in mm. and look into it. I suppose not structuring it too rigidly when you're asking <coughs> people to say, what, what do you think of that? Yeah. What would you think of this? Unless it's a time when all the buildings have been involved, it's pretty much public. I don't even say they don't really care. They don't see it as a scholarly way as easy as they would see it as a craft school. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
needs are outspread in some means. Um, and, and this is indeed its creativity in the situation. Um, there are examples in the world of the um, carvings have been replaced there when they leave, and they leave actually an angel holding a cell phone. <laughs> Do we want to go that far? What kind of redesign would you have in mind? Would we redesign with more modern content, or would we redesign with like a skeletal order of architecture? How would you go about it? Never got that far yet. That's the easy answer. Um, I mean, it's what, what we don't probably want to end up with, um, and again, you might disagree, is something that then sort of causes the, the whole thing to sort of disaggregate and separate out into bits and pieces. Um, whatever, if you decided to go for something you know, <coughs> different there, it would still have to accommodate and work with its background, I would say. Um, so how, and also not just the background of the, the, the casement, the porch, but the cathedral as a whole. And with it being a you know, World Heritage Site, while you know, we can hope for doing you know, new and creative things, the wealth of resistance around Owen is, or can be considerable about doing anything. Um, and so, you know, it, there would be lots of options there. I think I would consider I mean, the way to approach the question is to have it based on, on the three options, but I think to have quite clear expressions of what those options mean, but particularly in terms of supporting um trust skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the way it might, might be the Go for three, you know, you do this is to provide this, but it would also provide this great opportunity yeah. for people to to plant together. And that's much as good as parking complicated. And you don't in Durham at all. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's just the odd moulding, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> approach the question. Yeah. That's really helpful. Um, and the other thing, um, I was wondering if you could possibly add a bit. And fill in some way, um, which would then allow um, people probably to see the creation buildings on the front, um, and that it would just kind of end up with a cover in the glass, maybe. Oh, right. Those sorts of things often get raised, don't they, as options. And there are monuments in Malta where they decided not to do anything to the monument, and they just built a stadium like roof over the, the whole thing. I mean, it, 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 it's an option, but I and mean, the, the the deterioration will continue. I mean, if you if you encase something like that, aside from all of the sort of aesthetic debate and all of that, once a, a mechanism like that is in motion, if you close it in, it's it's likely to continue. So, I think we're beyond the point of some sort of encapsulation, but it's it's worth raising. Okay, right. So, No, I, I, that's a really good point because the, the whole World Heritage Site feasibility study, that, that, that was a starting point for the current HLF project, was driven by the, the entrenchment of County Durham um, within the recession and within an economic, you know, a real economic trench. And, um, and so what everything that's going on there is trying to say, look, we want to breathe life into County Durham again. We want to react against all of the problems of the decline in the coal mining industry, the, the level of social you know, sort of deprivation up there. And, um, and uh, without digressing too far, um, I'm working on a project at Auckland Castle, which is very much about regeneration and reinvestment, and, and also another topic of heritage philanthropy, which I think is 
really starting to bubble away in very interesting ways, um, which again is driven by you know, wanting to you know, add new things and pride and experience and, and, you know, into a county that has suffered a lot. I think these are the, this is the language to play it, if that's the direction it goes in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the, that's the vision. Allow your persons to reimagine which is a renaissance of <coughs> yeah, I was going to say something that built on the previous two which comments, which is that there is no right answer. And the minute that you start surveying people, well, then you start doing a question around which population did you actually survey, and it only happened to be the six people that were around you or the 12 people that had access to that particular survey we got, and then you feel the whole range of issues around inequality. And I think all of the research on archaeological education I think is clear that people are coming at it with so many different perspectives that it's impossible to tailor it to kind of perfect, you know, you yeah. can't make a perfect output. And I think that a lot of the research shows that professionals tend to underestimate just how sophisticated um, the general population is when they approach these. Um, you know, whether it's an extending monument or whatever, it's a completely fictive creation about the, uh, about the past. And, uh, and so I think that what it really this all leads into is a kind of emphasis upon allowing, you know, those who are working on this to be creative and, you know, invest in them, producing something new, so, and then contextualizing it so that those that come to see it understand what you try to do and you can get them built upon it or, you know, tear it apart and start themselves. So. Mm. But there's some kind of conceptual rationale for the creativity itself to be Yeah. It's not just like a open season for anybody to come up with any. No, and that's what I mean by having a context. So then you understand how it was, what it was built out of, out of what was the rationale. Yeah, it just didn't pop up in your head. And Well, thank you so much, Alex, and I think you can tell from the amount of discussion there's been, and I hope you found some of the questions. That's brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Yeah. We'll kind of look forward to working back to that in a few years' time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least. <laughs> At least. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we'll be here again next week. Uh, John